Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to this, the first webinar of the International Association of Constitutional Laws Research Group, a newly founded research group on public law responses to public health emergencies. Um, my name is Oren Doyle. I'm one of the conveners of this research group. Um, and um, along with Professor Giuliano Zaiden Benvindo of the University of Brasilia and Dr. Chiara Chiara Graziani of the University of Genova and the Bocconi University in Italy. Um, I want to do one thing with my video before I forget to get that right. Um, so, yeah. Um, the, so the plan of the research group is to run, first of all, a series of webinars where we explore different aspects of how public law is responding to public health emergencies. Um, and we're very grateful to the Trinity Centre for Constitutional Governance, a newly established research centre in Trinity College Dublin, for being the hosts of this webinar. Uh, but we do hope to roll out more, particularly in the new year. We hope that those of you who are joining us on this uh, for this webinar will become members of the research group if you haven't already. We'll follow up with an email to you after today's webinar so that you can uh, email us to sign up if you want to do so. Maybe suggest other topics on which we could be holding webinars, other sorts of events that we should be putting together as we try to get this research group established. Uh, we're hugely grateful to Professor Cheryl Saunders for leading this first webinar. Um, it is customary, but still true to say that she needs no introduction, but I will give you a brief introduction anyway. Uh, she is the Laureate Professor Emeritus at the University of Melbourne Law School, President Emeritus of the International Association of Constitutional Law, and truly just one of the foremost figures in our field of comparative constitutional law. We couldn't think of any better person to get this research group started, and we're really grateful that she said yes. She's going to reflect on the topic, constitutional emergency frameworks, experiences with COVID-19. She's going to talk for about 20 or 20 minutes or so. Then there will be plenty of time for questions and discussion after that. The way we will operate that is if you use the Q&A function uh, and type your question in there, more or less. Um, and I will keep an eye on those. And then in the discussion section, I will call on you that I'm going to ask you to ask your question. I have to do some very fancy technological things. And then you'll be able to turn on your camera and ask your question. And we can have a bit of a discussion. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Professor Saunders. Thank you again for uh, speaking to us and inviting you to uh, offer us your reflections on this topic. Thank you. Thanks very much, Aaron. Um, it's uh, great to be joining you all today. Uh, well, it's been an honour to have been invited to speak in the first webinar of this newly formed and extremely timely research group. When I first expressed interest in the work of the group, I just began thinking about constitutional provision for emergency conditions, actually in the context of the Australian bushfires last January. Since then, I've become a little wiser, both about the pandemic and the complexity of the legal arrangements that have framed the responses to it, hence the rather cautious title of this webinar. There's also been a welter of publications over the course of the year about how the pandemic's been handled from a constitutional standpoint in various regions of the world. This provides a tremendous resource for the research group as it pursues some of the critical questions it's identified. And I've found much of that writing useful uh, for organizing my own thoughts today. So my goal in this webinar is to map some of the constitutional issues that seem to me to arise from responses to the pandemic so far. And I'll organize these around three broad themes. First of all, express constitutional provision for emergencies. Secondly, the roles of legislatures in responding to the pandemic, including through ordinary legislation. Uh, and thirdly, the interaction between constitutional provision for multi-level government and the management of COVID-19. But before launching into these, I need to make two sets of introductory remarks uh, to try to set the scene. Now, the first of these concerns comparative method. On the face of it, a comparative public law project exploring the constitutional implications of a global pandemic 
that has affected virtually every country in the world uh, is a complete gift. On the other hand, the assessments that can properly be made are complicated by various strands of overlapping diversity, not only in particular responses to the pandemic, but in the contexts in which those responses apply. Relevant aspects of context include most obviously the constitutional frameworks themselves, the stability and effectiveness of government, economic capacity uh, and geography. But they also include cultural factors that are more difficult to get a handle on and to weigh in the balance. Consider, for example, what's been thought to be required in different states to restrict physical and social contact, generally considered a key to the necessary health response. In some states of which Japan is an example, much can be achieved simply by asking people to refrain from going out. In others of which Australia is an example, legal rules have been necessary enforced by state action, but the degree of public compliance has been noteworthy, indicating underlying acceptance and trust. And in others of which the United States seems to be an example, legal rules are resisted claiming priority for individual liberty. Now, of course, each of those cases is more complex, requiring carefully anal careful analysis, and in no state, uh, cultural attitudes of this kind are homogenous. But I'm confident enough about the point I seek to make, that cultural difference on this and other issues is another factor to consider in this project. My second introductory remark concerns the nature of the emergency that COVID-19 presents. Relevant characteristics that occur to me are the following. Collectively, they're distinctive, justifying description of the pandemic as an emergency, but an emergency with a difference for constitutional purpose, purposes that's relevant to assessment of its constitutional implications. First point, the virus is a significant threat to life and long-term health, although in ways that are selective, unpredictable, uh, and still being understood. Uncontrolled, it's a threat both to the life and health of a significant number of the population and the capacity of health systems generally uh, requiring government action of some kind. Secondly, an effective response to the pandemic involves both health and economic policy. The latter not only to support health measures, but also to manage the economic fallout of the pandemic. The tension, there is tension between these two, which exacerbates division. Thirdly, and paradoxically, COVID-19 is both a global phenomenon and one that is intensely local, requiring effective action on the part of state or sub-state governments. Spread of the virus may be assisted by closing external and internal borders, presenting yet another range of constitutional issues. Fourth, the response to the pandemic undeniably relies on experts, although there's room for some disagreement about the, what the precise role of experts should be. And finally, the challenge presented by the pandemic may disrupt the process of, process of government, including the holding of elections and the meetings of legislatures. An effective response to the pandemic may also impact on rights, but in ways that arguably can be managed within the ordinary constitutional framework perhaps by recourse to proportionality reasoning without needing to rely on specific emergency provisions. So now let me move to um, the first of my themes, express emergency provisions. In a paper helpfully sent to me by Stefan Voigt, it was estimated that nine out of 10 constitutions in the world contain express emergency provisions. In the context of COVID-19, however, that interesting statistic only takes us so far. Anecdotally, the provisions themselves are extraordinarily, extraordinarily diverse. They're not necessarily suitable for this particular emergency, and they've not necessarily been used to respond to this emergency. So let me briefly elaborate each of those points in turn. I base the claim about the diversity of constitutional emergency provisions largely on a recent Asia Pacific webinar in which I participated. Clearly a more wide ranging picture needs what is likely to be laborious work. Of the five case studies in that webinar in the session on constitutional emergency powers, one, Japan had no such powers. 
The, while the other four, the Philippines, Thailand, Solomon Islands, and Timor-Leste, had emergency provisions, these varied significantly in the types of emergencies they contemplated, in the respective roles of the executive and the legislature, in the safeguards against abuse or misuse, and in the relationship between emergency provisions and the rest of the constitution. There are some commonalities in each case, as you would suppose, but the mix and the detail have implications that need to be pinned down. Thus, for example, while the Thai constitution apparently subjects an emergency decree by the king to significant political and judicial safeguards, the absence of prescribed time limits enables, enabled an emergency decree from 2005 to be invoked again to handle the pandemic. The lack of fit between the emergency represented by COVID-19 and many constitutional emergency procedures is equally significant. The archetypal constitutional emergency is a security emergency of some kind, calling for a particular type of response, presenting particular challenges to constitutional norms, attracting particular safeguards. Many recent constitutional emergency provisions do contemplate emergency of other kinds, or at least include a catch-all to serve the same ends. But conceptually, such provisions still tend to be framed with security emergencies in mind in terms of the norms they consider to be at risk and the safeguards that are provided. Take the Constitution of Kenya as one fairly recent state-of-the-art instrument, at least on paper. The emergency provision in section 58 applies to war, invasion, insurrection, disorder, natural disaster, and other public emergency. A declaration can be made only when necessary, a standard that's judicially reviewable. Strict time limits are imposed, initially of 14 days, and thereafter of a maximum of two months at a time, with each extension requiring accelerated majorities in the National Assembly, rising quite quickly to three quarters majority approval. Whatever the democratic merits of that provision, and they are of course considerable, there's a real question whether these procedures provide a suitable framework for responding to COVID-19. Complications include the difficulty of face-to-face -face legislative meetings during the pandemic, particularly in its early stages as people were getting used to how to handle it. Uh, and they also include the types of tensions generated by the management of the pandemic, making super majorities in the assembly highly problematic. I was prompted to think along related lines on reading the emergency provisions in the constitution of the Solomon Islands, which places specific and lengthy safeguards around detention during an emergency. These safeguards clearly are directed to detention of the kind associated with threats to national security. They may be unworkable, in their application to communities in quarantine or under stay at home orders. Thirdly, express constitutional emergency pr procedures have not necessarily been used for the purpose of COVID-19. Many governments have relied on ordinary legislation instead. Kenya was a case in point and may still be, South Africa is another. Papua New Guinea is an interesting example of both. It has an innovative constitutional emergency procedure uh, which provides for an inclusive emergency committee and continuing parliamentary oversight, and which was used for the pandemic at the outset. But by June, PNG had moved to management of the pandemic under a newly elect an elected National Pandemic Act 2020 uh, and had abandoned the constitutional procedure. There's been much speculation, some of it no doubt justified, that governments have relied on ordinary legislation rather than constitutional emergency provisions because the latter imposes safeguards that ordinary legislation avoids. As I suggested earlier, however, it's equally possible in at least some cases that the emergency provisions are not apt for the purpose and even are inconsistent with effective management of the pandemic. And there may be other explanations that are available as well in particular cases. Thus in South Korea, Avoidance of the emergency power enabled the government to deal with the pandemic with a lighter hand than resort to the emergency power with its worrying historical connotations would have implied. So the second theme is the role of legislatures. 
you know, whether constitutional emergency procedures are used or not, legislation of some kind is needed to support the complex public health response required for COVID-19. If a constitutional emergency provision is used, it often requires initial approval by the legislature. The implementing legislation may transcend constitutional norms, and the provision may involve ongoing accountability to the legislature, if only to renew the emergency from time to time. If a constitutional emergency procedure is not used, either because it does not exist or because it is avoided, whatever legislative or executive action is taken must comply with the ordinary constitution. For the purposes of the pandemic, some states have used existing, sometimes very old, health or emergency legislation, making new legislative approval unnecessary. Other states have enacted new legislation for the purpose. Some states have procedures whereby an emergency can be declared by executive action alone. A declaration of emergency within the framework of the ordinary constitution whether under legislation or in the exercise of executive power, may trigger provisions in other legislation authorizing government action that is constitutional but would not normally be used or acceptable, including sometimes invoking uh, the use of the armed forces. Some of these provisions also impose time limits with requirements to account to the legislature before the so-called ordinary emergency is renewed. These non-constitutional emergency procedures aside, the, mechaniz the mechanisms for accountability that apply are those that apply to ordinary governance in ordinary times, legislative supervision of executive actions, such as it is, and judicial review. Now, these are the processes on which many states have relied for the purposes of the pandemic and which go to the heart uh, of this theme of the research group's interests. Tracking them reliably is a mammoth task, but let me make a few generalizations about them, which I think are broadly accurate and which identify some of the issues that arise. Much of the legislation confers sweeping subordinate lawmaking power and extensive executive discretion on public officers. Regulation through delegated legislative instruments has been voluminous. Uh, these instruments have been changed rapidly with changing responses to the management of the pandemic. Part of the confusion about what is law and what is, quotes, guidance, close quotes, is attributable to this. The discretions exercisable under the legislation also are sweeping and sometimes hard to distinguish from delegated legislation. The story about health experts fits in here. Some legislation confers powers on them directly, but whether this occurs or not, they play a role, the extent of which varies between states in the way in which these various powers are exercised, feeding into concerns about accountability. Now, of course, procedures for political scrutiny continue to apply, unless deliberately changed by the legislation, which sometimes is the case. But legislative majorities, often supine in any event, are likely to be even more compliant in these conditions. The nature of this emergency also has, been made, has made it hard for legislatures or legislative committees to meet regularly, physically or even virtually. And in extreme cases of which Sri Lanka is an example, elections have been postponed and there is no legislature in operation at all, at least for a time. Now, of course, again, procedures for judicial review also continue to apply, but with similar caveats. The width of the powers granted under pandemic legislation means that formal lawfulness often is not an issue. In the context of, the, of an emergency and in the face of advice by experts, courts also may be deferential uh, in any event. A, uh, all of these processes disturb the balance between the legislative, executive, and perhaps judicial branches, wherever this lies in each state. In some cases, they exacerbate existing trends, heightening suspicion, that reversal may be difficult to achieve once the emergency passes. With hindsight, it's possible to see that at least some of these practices are, are attributable to the speed with which the pandemic developed and the urgency of the need to respond to it quickly. Drawing on the experiences of 2020, it also is evident that matters could have been handled better in the sense of providing for greater legislative involvement with the consequences for accountability 
and transparency this may bring in its wake. But here again, an issue arises prompted in part by the nature of this emergency. What is the appropriate role for a legislature in these circumstances? And in particular, of members not affiliated with the governing party. An idealist might say that the legislature should nevertheless reflect community concerns, critique government proposals, point out disproportionality and scrutinize maladministration. But the temptation is to oppose for the sake of opposing along lines that risk being destructive rather than constructive, undermining the public trust on which critically the response to the pandemic depends. Does this matter? If so, what can be done about it? These questions suggest that the project on public law responses to the pandemic could become part of an even larger inquiry into the purposes and modalities of political representation in the conditions of the 21st century. There are some good news stories about, public account, about, about political accountability for pandemic responses as well. Some legislatures reconfigured their procedures quickly to facilitate regular meetings of the body as a whole or key committees. Some elections were held safely, even at the height of the pandemic, with South Korea a familiar exemplar. Some states adopted highly innovative public law procedures as the pandemic uh, approached. New Zealand, for example, prioritised accountability, including through a newly constituted epidemic response committee chaired by the leader of the opposition, which met regularly during the lockdown. And New Zealand also made all the cabinet documents relevant to the response to the pandemic publicly available. Finland has reported to have invited public scrutiny of decrees through real-time real posting on a legal blog. Responses of this kind reflect a belief that public trust might best be built by transparency, effective communication and understanding, promising insights that other democratic systems could usefully explore. My third and last theme emerges from consideration of the constitutional emergency frameworks used to respond that, that emerges from, from, from consideration, sorry, of the constitutional emergency frameworks responding to COVID-19 is multi-level government. This category most obviously includes federations, but might be extended to others uh, in which more localized government also plays a significant role. The theme's relevant for several reasons. Typically, constitutional emergencies concentrate public power in the central level of government. When this occurs, it removes what otherwise may be a significant check and balance in the system of government and denies the enhanced democratic representation that multi-level government may bring. And secondly, insofar as both levels of government play a role in response to an emergency, questions of the kind already explored about the impact of the pandemic on the separation of powers apply at the sub-national as well as the central level. Exactly how multi-level government has played out across the world in response to the pandemic varies along a range of axes that include the design of the multi-level system itself. But resorting again to generalizations, there are grounds to suggest that the pandemic presented a distinctive kind of emergency, often engaging multi-level government in a distinctive way, sometimes presenting distinctive challenges. And these grounds include the following. Many formal federal, federal systems of the world either did not have or did not use express constitutional emergency powers, managing the pandemic through the ordinary division of powers. In these federations, response to the pandemic typically required the exercise of power by both levels of government. By way of example, powers in relation to health, hospitals, police and schools often are exercised at the subnational level while powers over international borders and income support usually are central powers. It's evident from this account that powers to do with health tend to be concentrated at the subnational level and those to do with economic management tend to be the responsibility of the center. And this gives the ideological tensions inherent in the response to the pandemic a distinctly federal dynamic. Even without pointing to the implications of the federal division of powers, Experience with the pandemic bears out the importance of a capacity for local action. An effective response may call for different measures around the country, 
local leadership and knowledge may be useful for engendering trust and encouraging compliance. The differing authorities and competing interests of levels of government in responding to the pandemic necessitates coordinated action that also preserves the potential for appropriate local responsiveness. This is no easy task, calling for a willingness to negotiate and compromise, often across party political lines. Where it's worked reasonably well, as in, for example, Germany and Australia, it offers insight into the constructive potential of multi-level government uh, that may be useful in other contexts. Even where central coordination fell short, with the United States as an example, the pandemic showed how multi-level government could provide some safeguard in difficult times. But intergovernmental coordination can have a downside as well, blurring accountability for the decisions that are taken. Let me give you one example from Australia to make the point. Intergovernmental relations in Australia typically take place through a meeting of government leaders augmenting the dominance of the executive branch and creating a phenomenon sometimes called executive federalism. For the purposes of the response to the pandemic, a new intergovernmental institution was established to enable a frank exchange between political leaders drawing on the collective views of their respective health experts. Uh, oddly, the new, that, that arrangement worked very well, particularly at the beginning uh, of the management of that pandemic. But oddly, the new body is located within the Com Commonwealth cabinet system, apparently in order to claim cabinet in confidence status for its deliberations. The contrast with neighboring New Zealand could not be more stark and a judicial challenge presently is underway, uh, the outcome of which should be interesting. So in conclusion, as I was beginning to think about what I might say today, I came across an article in Slate in which the author, Joshua Keating, uh, expressed a mea culpa for earlier published views that the responses to COVID-19 threatened democracy. In their place, he gave a range of reasons why overall the pandemic has the potential to strengthen democracy. These included the need for governments to actually govern in order to respond effectively to the pandemic exposing leaders who rely on ideology alone. And it also includes heightened consciousness about governance processes and practice, practices uh, on the part of many people who do not generally bother about such things. But not every assessment of the constitutional implications of COVID-19 is so positive. Different parts of the world have experienced it differently. Many of the measures taken to manage the pandemic have affected people in different degrees, sometimes disastrously, even from a public law perspective. However, the overall result is assessed moreover. It's, ev it's evident even from the cursory summary of the issues that I've been able to give, that a range of practices has been used to deal with the current emergency that ought to be abandoned as soon as the emergency is under control. It's also evident that there are innovative practices to be harvested, and more conceptual thinking to be done about how constitutions should handle new kinds of emergencies. This pandemic has been one such emergency and the fallout of climate change certainly will produce others. For these and similar reasons, the establishment of this group is welcome. I began by suggesting that the group has taken on a challenging project in terms of comparative method. And I hope I've made that case at least. But the IACL is particularly well equipped to provide the global range that the project requires. I'm very pleased to be a member of the group and I look forward uh, to its other activities. And I'm also very pleased to have been given the incentive to begin to think about some of these issues for the purposes of this inaugural webinar. So thanks, Oren, back to you. Thanks, thanks, Cheryl. That's a, a wonderful introduction. I'm sure if we were gathered in person, there'd be spontaneous applause at the moment. <laughs> that's going I'll on. take it as red. Thank you. Yeah, that's going on across the world. I think as, as you were speaking, and particularly in, in the first two sections, I thought you could have been speaking about Ireland, which is the country I know best, um, not, uh, not doesn't have multi-level governance. Um, but I think that shows to me the extent to which there is a commonality of experience here across countries which is, I think is reassuring for the mission of the group without in any way trying to 
downplay the different contextual factors that would need to be taken into account in assessing how different countries have responded. So I think the, you've given us a wonderful overview. You've uh, provided a, a thematic account that really draws out the areas that we should focus on, but also as a thematic account that, that rang true to me, that really did seem to capture uh, the reality that I've been studying. So I think that that sets us up well as, as a research mission for the group. Um, so would encourage people to ask questions uh, in the Q&A. There's one there. So I'm going to uh, call on Antra, Antara Balaji uh, to ask a question about uh, the ICCPR. So let me just, um, I'm promoting Antara to being a panelist. Um, and then they should appear. Yes, so Antara, are you able to, uh, turn on your camera and microphone uh, to put your question, please. Um, hello, I hope I'm audible. Yep. Yeah, I'm sorry, my, my camera seems to be facing a problem over the past few days, so if that's yeah, okay. No problem. No problem. Yeah. Um, uh, good evening, Professor. Uh, I'm from India, so it's noon right now. Um, yeah, so my question is actually, um, it might be a little uh, on the legal side because I'm a law student and, you know, I was studying about it. So, um, you know, the COVID emergency uh, responses by a few states, uh, like uh, the UK, for example, has enacted the Coronavirus Act 2020, or um, Italy has invoked emergency provisions of uh, law. So what about the obligations of these states when it comes to human rights? They might be derogating from human rights under the disguise of this pandemic, which is what we've been, I mean, we've been reading about it quite a bit in the news, that some states have invoked uh, an emergency of under the name of COVID, but they are derogating from the civil liberties and democratic rights of people to suppress media, for example, or dissemination of information. So uh, I just wanted to know your view on it. Um, well, clearly um, uh, some states have used the, uh, uh, the cloak of the pandemic, if you like, um, to do things that are not necessary, uh, well, not obviously necessary uh, for a health response. Um, but some of the things are necessary for a health response. Some erosion uh, of things that normally would be regarded as civil liberties uh, is necessary to control this pandemic uh, or people will die um, and the manner of their death may also infringe human dignity. Uh, so it's, it's the old issue, isn't it? It comes back to uh, a question of proportionality and also comes back to mechanisms for accountability uh, to ensure that governments who are trying, to, sometimes in good faith, uh, to deal with a very difficult emergency, uh, directing their attention to the right things and not the wrong things. Okay. Um, so, the so, so the standards you point to in the ICCPR could equally be pointed to uh, in many in many constitutions, um, and much of this legislation uh, is enacted uh, under the umbrella of constitutions that also protect similar rights. Right. Um, I'm sorry if I can just have a follow up question over here. Uh, so you so you do agree that uh, there has to be a constitutional provision for emergencies in place uh, before enacting uh, before enacting an extraordinary law, like like for example, uh, what would you say if a state did not have any emergency provisions in their constitution? For example, Italy, right? Um, Italy does not. Um, seem to expressly refer to emergency provisions in their constitution, yet during the pandemic, they have enacted an extraordinary legislation um, to respond to the COVID emergency. Yeah, no, I don't agree that there has to be constitutional emergency provisions in order to uh, enact some of this legislation. Um, one of the points I was trying to make in my presentation uh, is that much of the legislation that's been acted is that has been relied on is ordinary legislation uh, relacted, enacted uh, pursuant to the umbrella uh, of the constitution, uh, presenting the possibility of constitutional challenges. Some of those challenges have, have taken place uh, in some countries and sometimes they succeed and sometimes they don't. Uh, 
Um, but when they don't succeed, uh, it's generally because the measures that have been taken, which have been taken in the interests of health and public safety, um, are proportionate uh, to the um, to, to the impact that's that, that's occurred. Uh, so, uh, um, so it's really a, an ordinary constitutional analysis to that extent, uh, but in extraordinary circumstances. The other thing I would say, and again, I tried to say this in my presentation, but I. I know it all becomes a very sort of complicated mix of, uh, of legislative measures. Um, some of the legislation that's been enacted doesn't necessarily threaten constitutional or international norms, but it's the sort of legislation that you usually wouldn't want to see. Uh, legislation, for example, that delegates an extraordinary amount of power uh, lawmaking power sometimes uh, to the executive branch. Um, and normally, in normal times, you see that legislation and you complain about it bitterly. Uh, there's still some complaints about it in, even in these extraordinary times. Um, but it's been assumed to be necessary for purposes of managing the current emergency. What I would say, however, and I hope that this is an issue that the research group might take up, um, is that once the emergency dies down, uh, that sort of legislation uh, should, be, uh, should be ended and we should go back to more normal uh, legislative times. Um, so yeah, thanks, for, thanks for that question, follow-up, Antra, and, and the response. It makes me wonder, in a sense of the pandemic, um, exposing features of constitutional systems that already exist. Um, so at opposite ends of the scale, maybe Hungary becomes a bit more like Hungary in its response to the pandemic. New Zealand becomes an even more New Zealandish example of New Zealand in, in its response. Yeah. Um, but it can be very hard to work out on that. This may be a particular challenge for comparative constitutional approaches with distance brings some advantages, but from a distance to, distance to work out whether a particular response in a country is truly a reasonable and proportionate response to the public health emergency, or is actually the cover for something else. Um, mm. well, yeah, well, hopefully your group can sort of begin to, to tackle some of, uh, some of those questions. Um, but I agree with what you say about, you know, Hungary can become more hungry and New Zealand can become more New Zealand. And one of the things that worried me about the, um, uh, the response, particularly in Australia, uh, where you know, just because I'm more familiar with it, is that there, there had already been um, a tendency for executive power creep, um, whether pursuant to legislation or through some sort of uh, concept of inherent executive power. Um, and COVID, well, the response to COVID has certainly exacerbated that. Uh, and so I think a certain amount of vigilance and um, deliberate argument will be necessary to wind it back. And I do think that pointing uh, to the positive cases around the world could be quite useful uh, to that of, to, for that purpose, um, uh, including identifying the positive benefits that some of those approaches bring. I mean, it's not just New Zealand and Finland. Uh, I mean, Taiwan, where you are at the moment, uh, is another case. Um, South Korea is another one. I mean, there's quite a number of, of countries that uh, really thought quite hard uh, about the public law response uh, in relation to COVID, sometimes because they'd had previous experience with previous pandemics, um, uh, which also is another sort of factor to take into account. Um, so I, I mean, I'm going to ask a question of my own. If anybody has any other questions, to make sure to, to put them into the Q&A so, so we get them before our time is up. I'm wondering about the, the label or the concept of emergency. So of course, to the ordinary person on the street, this is a public health emergency. But the word emergency comes with a whole lot of other conceptual, maybe even emotional baggage in constitutional law. Um, and maybe they overlap. So maybe something that should be an emergency in a constitutional, something that is an emergency in a public health sense should be an emergency in a constitutional sense. Um, 
but but maybe they don't. Um, some probably. Yeah. Look, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think. Are you glad? Sorry. I, I certainly think we need to think about it, um, uh, not just for public health, but I also do think that once you know, climate change starts biting in, that will throw up emergencies that may be a bit similar to this uh, in, in some respects. Um, and I'm sure that um, existing constitutional emergency provisions will often not be apt to dealing with it. Um, and uh, it's also the case, as I think I've been arguing tonight, um, that the proper responses to those emergencies often can be handled within an ordinary constitutional framework. Um, but sometimes handling them within an ordinary constitutional framework, while appropriate, uh, also diminishes accountability. So there's an interesting question there. Should we think about framing new procedures, whether they're called emergency or rapid action or something else, uh, mm. that might be useful to deal with some of the um, issues that we see coming along? I mean, my, it, my own instinct but is to say, no, we, we, we can do without um, treating public health um, responses as emergencies, really for some of the reasons that you give. Um, but I suspect that that's because I'm familiar with systems that do it that way. Um, and uh, it may be that other people would have different views. I think I'm inclined to agree, but as you were talking, I was wondering, might there be an exceptionality point that it might, in terms of avoiding the set of setting of precedents so that constitutionally suboptimal practices don't spread from the urgency of the pandemic context into other contexts afterwards that perhaps identifying them as exceptional would be helpful. Well, that was the Bruce Ackerman point, wasn't it? After 9-11. Um, after uh, so that's one way of dealing with the, the emergency creep. Um, but another way of dealing with it you know, is simply to be a bit vigilant about it. Um, I mean, I would, I, and I think that there is a chance. So that Joshua Keating piece that I referred to um, towards the end of my talk, um, I think was arguing amongst other things that um, people's consciousness of these things were now raised a bit. So I think that there is a chance that um, once the immediate health emergency dies down, which I suspect will be when the vaccine finally comes, um, parliaments or maybe mini publics of other kinds um, might sort of take up the question, well, what have we learnt about accountability uh, during um, this sort of emergency and how do we how do we think we went with handling it and how do we think we might have done better um, and what could we what can we put in place I mean one of the things that can clearly be put in place are parliamentary procedures that allow for remote parliaments um, uh, in those states where that was simply constitutionally impossible because of the rigidity of the constitution um, yeah. so there's all sorts of mopping up that can be done um, and uh, I'm not convinced that we need formal constitutional emergency procedures to do it, or even that they will necessarily be particularly helpful. Yeah. Um, so we have a, a further question from Pedro Alvarez de, de Carvalhal. Um, so I am going to um, promote you, Pedro, um, to the much sought after status of panelist. Uh, which will allow you to uh, put your question to Professor Saunders as a question about the interaction between courts and the executive. Um, so you should be able to turn your camera on now if it's functioning and you'd like to ask your question. Uh, I'm sorry, I just... Yep, no worries, we can, we can hear you anyway, so that's... Uh... Okay, uh, thank you very much for allowing me Hi, to Pedro. meet. <laughs> Um, nice to see you in person. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Um, in, in Portugal, we have uh, a provision in the constitution uh, which uh, uh, entails uh, a, possi a possibility of 
emergency state in case of public calamity. Mm -hmm. uh, in this second wave, uh, the, um, the, the, the executive opted to do uh, executive re resolutions without going to the parliament. Uh, and uh, those resolutions um, entailed uh, uh, a limit to the freedom of circulation. And the freedom of circulation is one of our uh, guaranteed and fundamental rights. And it is only possible to limit that freedom in the state of emergency or by uh, uh, a law uh, by the parliament. And we had uh, two uh, court, uh, uh, court, uh, I mean, court filings. And uh, one was overruled in, by questions of standing, I, I suppose in common law, you call it that. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and the other one went to the, the bottom of the question. And uh, I was very surprised. I'm a judge, and I, I, but not in the, in the uh, administrative law courts. So I'm a civil uh, commercial judge. Anyway, I'm, I'm very curious about these things. Um, and in that, in that second decision, the court um, ruled the resolution to be admissible mm -hmm. in the grounds of considering it like a reinforced recommendation. Uh, ah. For me, that's uh, unbelievable. Uh, it, there was a dissent opinion. I think you say it like this. Um, and uh, when I read the decision, I found that the, the rationale be, behind the decision was not constitutional law or even a, 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 a judicial reasoning, but, and that is my question, but the overwhelmingly, the, over, the judges being overwhelmed by the scientific and technical questions of COVID. And that to yeah. me is a concern. Thank yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a real concern. That's a very, very interesting example, Pedro. Thank you so much. Can I ask right. you something about it? Um, yeah. so, so when the court says that this was okay because it was a reinforced recommendation, yes. does that mean it, they're saying it's not law? It's just that's a very the problem. strong... That's the problem. They, they turn, they, 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 they turn the, I mean, they bypass that question by saying uh, it's not a real law, but it is a real law because if people go from county to country, uh, they are if, if if the police stops them and they don't have a uh, one of the and they and they, they and they aren't one aren't in the exceptions that allow people to uh, move, they are criminal uh, criminally responsible. So the yeah. decision of the court was. I mean, was uh, I, so I think worried. I think that's a really fascinating case. And I think it's one of the issues that I think the research group could very fruitfully take up. You know, this, this question has emerged in a number of places, um, not quite as uh, blatantly as in Portugal, yeah. <laughs> where it's pretty in your face. But um, the idea that uh, when you have a political leader standing up there saying everyone wear, must wear masks or uh, no one can go out of their house after eight o'clock tonight because this is in the community interest. Um, what is that? You know, is that a, 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 law, a, a mandate from the state or is it just you know, a recommendation? Um, and there are some court cases around about this now. Um, New Zealand. The famous New Zealand also had a court case on this, and I'm, I suspect there will be others. And it would be very useful uh, to get a little comparative project going uh, on exactly this um, issue, um, because it's a pretty important question to resolve, uh, the, you know, the difference between law and a recommendation. Yes, soft law um, and uh, art law. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is, but, you know, yeah, 
so it is soft law and hard law, but uh, you don't really want one to morph into the other. Yes, that's um, the problem. So, so, I mean, of course, we can all accept that when a court is faced with that sort of challenge uh, during the second wave, which is you know, very serious for everyone, um, then the court is a bit anxious. On the other hand, this doesn't really seem to me to be an issue that necessarily turns on expert evidence. You know, the question of whether it's law yes, or it's... not is something that a court ought to be able uh, to resolve. Um, whereas we're in, in Australia at the moment, we've got a court case that's actually going to be decided tomorrow uh, about whether the state borders are um, lawfully closed under a constitution that says interstate movement is absolutely free. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the court is, I suspect, going to say something like, um, well, in these circumstances, um, closing them during the height of the pandemic was a proportionate response. Um, uh, and it's very hard for us to, 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 to actually do a proportionality analysis here, given the weight of expert evidence. You know, you can imagine that sort of... Yes, sir. can I say something or ask you? Yeah. Uh, isn't it the, the form, the legal form of, of procedure, a protection to the substantive law or justice? So if you have in case in, Port in Portugal, we have uh, the framing in the constitution and uh, in the relation between executive power, uh, Republic, the president of the Republic and the parliamentary solutions to obey to the demands of constitution. I don't think it's reasonable to bypass those rules in yeah. order to be forced hard law, because in the case I'm talking about, there is a criminal response if you don't obey. You How can there possibly be? Yeah, well, that's the problem. <laughs> so the problem was also, was already solved. Why? Because the uproar was uh, so intense that the executive asked the president to declare the emergency state. Which right. in our case, because we have the, the, the clause uh, public calamity, I think it's, I think it's, it fits in the constitution, so it's solved yeah. and and possible and and, possi and it makes possible to curtail or suspend uh, yeah. until, in a certain measure, the fundamental rights. So yeah. no, I think that's we a solved good that problem. Yeah, but. Yeah, yeah. All, but but the first decision, I was really amazed. Yeah. Well, thank you Me very too. much. But it's very interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks. Right. We a, return to Aaron. That's a that's a really interesting case. Uh, so useful to to find out more about that as well. Um, yeah, isn't it fascinating? Mm. I think around the there's also the question of what is. As, as you were saying, what is it? Is it advice? Uh, just when a, a government minister speaks or the prime minister announces, you know, as of midnight tonight, you, you must not leave your homes. There's an awful lot of, in the English language anyway, and I'm sure in other languages as well, just ambiguity around these normative terms. In Ireland, the, um, uh, there's a 14-day quarantine period, but it's just advice. There's some legal obligations about filling in forms about where you will stay. Uh, but it's advice to restrict your movements rather than legally enforced quarantine. But if you read the website of the Department of Foreign Affairs, it said the Irish authorities require you to quarantine for 14 days, uh, which in, in what bizarre, sense require. Um, I don't so. think we want the idea of a reinforced recommendation by the executive to take off. <laughs> no. Um, that is a yeah. That's a, that's a, that's one of the ones. That's a precedent that we do not want to. Yeah, uh, we, we can do without it. Yeah, without this emergency. Um, but there's lots of interesting questions there for the group. Um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting one to pursue, actually. Yeah, and also maybe even even just getting a handle on how it is being done differently mm. or do mm. different legal systems. Yeah. Different approaches.
Um, and maybe it can be done under the under the rubric of hard law and soft law. I mean, there, there may be a sort of a hard law, soft law dimension mm -hmm. uh, of um, the work of the research group that could certainly pick up that issue. Um, yeah. But there is something, I think here, the, the communication is so direct to all citizens and covering things that everybody does. And it's not like being in a regulated sector of the economy where you have this ongoing relationship with your regulator and you're given these guidelines. It's the, um, so I think- Yeah, so we're, yeah, so the, the, the thing that gets me though, where do we draw the line between that um, and um, what I suggested um, I th it was the case in Japan where, you know, the government says, look, you know, in everybody's interest, we think X, Y, Z. I mean, that's the same thing. It's just that it's um, maybe more acceptable. Mm. I think that's I yeah. I, it just I feel needs like to be. It. it may depend on how it's culturally received, but I've, I've no yeah. problem with the government saying we're all in this together, and the way we're going to manage it is if everybody accepts a slightly arbitrary distance limit for how far you can travel, and yeah. so it's going to be five kilometers for everybody, and we're in it together. Um, but a sort of ambiguity as to whether people are liable to criminal punishment for that or not. Yes. Uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. People think they are when they aren't. That's I think the real rule of law problems. Yeah, there there will be lots of different views. Um, the, the, the is sort of want to conclude because we're coming up to the hour. Um, really want to thank you for giving your time. You've sort of simultaneously inspired me, but also scared me by uh, mapping <laughs> out an ambitious. That's not uh, good. <laughs> range of things that we should be considering, but it, it really does reinforce the, our, our view and also the view of the ISEL. This would be a good research group to establish at this time that there are issues as we move. There was an initial response and loads of wonderful work done by people, particularly for Fasson's blog and um, Joel yeah, Brogan. Yeah. It was great that, uh, responses, that which that, is just yeah. wonderful to build on. But I think there's no time where we need to step back and start thematizing the issues and really set us on agenda for that. So we're hugely grateful to you. Great. Um, well, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. So thanks for involving me, Oren, and I look forward to hearing about the next webinars. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, and thank you everybody else for joining us. Whether you ask questions or not, we hope you uh, enjoyed the webinar, and we'll, there'll be a follow-up email which will allow you to email us if you would like to be members of the group, so that you can make suggestions and be fully notified of all further events. So, thank you everybody, and goodbye. Thanks, everyone.